This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Element. You know that I begged for a grapefruit-flavored salt. For oh, my time. God. You were obsessed with the grapefruit I salt. I love grapefruit-flavored things. Yeah, I don't know what true. it is. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think I even... I've eaten maybe two grapefruits in like my life. It's like a sweet and a sour combination that gets you. I don't know what you. it is. But the grapefruit element is fantastic. In yeah. fact, as we move into this sort of... You know, it's a little... Winter little, season. Yeah, the shoulder season. I have been making a big flask... Of hot, hot element, grapefruit, hot grapefruit, and I sip on all day long. I feel so sophisticated. I'm drinking so, a little cup. So what's awesome is that grapefruit used to be a seasonal flavor, and people like you liked it so much that now it's available year round. I may or may not have hoarded it. Yeah, you know, we have like, lots of it at like our house. Like the Girl Scout cookie, you just drag through the whole year. You know. Yeah. So look, uh, one of the things that I'm realizing and continuing to realize is that if I am getting enough sodium. Lo and behold, enough electrolytes, I feel better, especially on low-carb days. Yeah, true fact. And again, huge fans of Grapefruit Element. If you order through our link, you get a free sample pack with all of Element's flavors. Go to drinkelement.com slash TRS. Hashtag, we literally drink it every day. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Vitruvian. One of the reasons I think a Vitruvian is a great choice for a home especially if you're getting kids under basic loads or you're working with beginners, is that you don't need lots and lots of different equipment. And one of the reasons that's salient is we know that probably the best way to progress people is something that's called a basic linear progression. Originally put out by Mark Ripito, but we have uh, used it as our rehab model. Basically, you're gonna do a little bit of work and then we're gonna add one or two pounds or five pounds the next time you do it. And we can make massive amounts of progress. The problem is, as you know, people don't have all those weights or all those dumbbells. Are you gonna have yeah. a 23 pound dumbbell and a 24 pound dumbbell and a 25 pound? It doesn't work. No, people just don't have the space for it. And they also don't know what to get. I mean, we get so many calls and requests and texts asking us like, okay, I wanna have a home gym, but like what two things do I need? And it turns out it's hard to be super effective with just two things. Yeah, you know, I think as you and I have spent more and more time working on, hey, we have all these tools how do we reduce the barriers to adherence? And if you can go out into your garage quickly and just do a few sets. Or even your living room. Yeah, I mean, three sets of five very quickly. And then tomorrow do three sets of five. You can work that into a busy schedule. And for children particularly and youth athletes, teenagers who I'm thinking about, it's very simple to get set up quickly under the front squat and go for it. Yeah, and more and more people are talking about the importance of strength training these days. It seems to be like a theme on the internet. And so I think a lot more people are interested in it, but there's just, you know, often it's it's overwhelming to figure out where to begin. And this is one of the places to yeah, begin. Yeah, and the device is fabulous. It does a lot of things, but that basic linear progression function, whew, gold. If you want to learn more about the Vitruvian, go to thereadystate.com slash Vitruvian. We are excited to welcome Dr. Tom Walters to the podcast today. Tom is a board-certified orthopedic physical therapist that specializes in the treatment of pain and movement disorders. He's the founder of Rehab Science and dedicates his time to teaching people about movement, pain, and how to most effectively recover from injury. Besides running his clinical practice, Tom served as a full-time undergraduate kinesiology professor for eight years, where he taught human biomechanics, therapeutic exercise, and pain science. This conversation with Tom is great. I've known Tom for a long time. One of the things that we're here to talk about is his work and what I think is pretty subversive. He's moving out a lot of very low level cookie cutter rehab. You might go in and see a physical therapist for acute things and putting it in a book and saying this belongs in your home. Yeah, he's just saying, hey, a lot of the stuff that you might think you need to go see a professional for, a practitioner for, you can actually really take care of on your own at home or with a coach or at your gym. This book is great, co-written by our good friend, Glenn Cordoza. But one of the things I love about it is if you could ask this kind of question, do I need a professional person to prescribe me clamshells? <laughs> do I need some really low-level therapeutic exercise? And what we find in, in our experience in this is that Exercise is safe, and it's really hard to mess yourself up doing this. And yet, if you engage with some of these principles, you'll have a better understanding of how your body works, and you'll be able to take a first crack at seeing if these things help your symptoms before you have to like sort of initiate the EMS system. 
Yeah, and I think um, you know we learned a ton of actionable things from Tom, and I have no doubt you will all enjoy this conversation. Tom, welcome to the Ready State Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, guys. This is awesome. Thank you. And I'm sure Kelly's going to want to tee off a question, but um, no. before he does... Hey, hey, two of us are physical therapists here. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. I'll, I'll be here to, to bring it down to reality. Anyway, what I want to start by saying is congratulations on your book. It's called Massive. Rehab Science. Um, you know, here it is for those on video. Um, man, I mean, this thing probably weighs like 40 pounds. Um, it reminds me a lot of Supple Leopard in its size and girth. Um, and I just want to say congratulations because... You know, there was a massive amount of work and effort put into this thing, um, and it looks beautiful, and I just want to give you a, a quick shout out on getting it done because I know it was not easy. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys know firsthand how this all goes, and congrats on your book that, I mean, I should be having you back on. Maybe we do a live or something at some point to talk about your book, but uh, yeah, I mean, such a journey. You guys totally know from all the books you have done already, and I've been following your podcast tour, and trying to be as cool. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's been, it's been a fun journey and, you know, Glenn's awesome. It's awesome to work with him. He's such a good, you know, just his wealth of experience creating books of this size and magnitude and just making it engaging, you know, cause you can imagine a textbook size book like this could be daunting and boring and intimidating to someone, but he's so good at helping organize stuff and put it together. So he's a ninja. yeah, he really is a okay. master at that, that skill. It's amazing. So th for those people who aren't you've kind of let out of the bag you have many hats professor physical therapist dare i say instagram darling um but tell us what this book is about mm -hmm. and why you felt compelled to under undergo this herculean task of writing this book yeah so the book really the motivation came from all this time on social media uh, especially on instagram you know, because, you know, my my posts over the years were very focused. They had a science kind of side to them, looking at pain and injury science from, you know, the, obviously the PT background, but from the years of teaching kinesiology. So I was kind of bringing those things together. And then a, a lot of the posts, probably, you know, every third post would be this carousel kind of post that would cover a condition, almost be like a mini protocol for a condition. And oh, yes. That didn't, my account didn't start that way. It just kind of evolved over time. And somehow I got into just, I would use like an anatomy image, talk about, okay, today's post is on patellar tendinopathy. Here's four or five exercises you could try implementing. And those turned out to be really popular. And it was so cool to see people over the years who didn't, a lot of times didn't have access to good care. I mean, they might be in spots in the world where it was too expensive or they couldn't access it. I mean, just regular individuals too in the US and all over that would would see those posts and do the exercises and really benefit from them. And, but the hang up was, you know, they're not comprehensive. It's not a full program. It's, and I didn't want people to think this is all physical therapy is. Um, also people just wouldn't be able to find things. You know, it's hard to search on social media and find, I'd get so many messages. Hey, do you have a hip impingement post? Do you have a plantar fasciitis post? And just constantly going back through my own page. You're like, I have 300 of those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've covered like, that about 80 times. I know I posted times. one who knows where. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully I tagged it correctly so I can find it again. Exactly. Yeah. So it was all that. Like I would have to go find stuff and send it to people. And so the book, a lot of the motivation of the book was to take all of that writing over, I guess, six years now and just put it into one resource and to have, in a, way, a lot of ways, like Supple Leopard, have... Um, you know, the, these applied things you could start implementing right away. So it wasn't just a book of information, but you asked, also had all the programs and protocols that you could use to basically self-manage your own issues. So we're going to get into talking a bit more about the book. In fact, a lot more about the book, but before we do that, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your physical therapy journey. Um, I know that you worked as a traditional physical therapist. Uh, my understanding is it wasn't totally for you, which I'll let you explain why and sort of the different path that you've taken with your own career as a physical therapist. And, you know, obviously now an author, but, um, just tell us a little bit about that sort of professional trajectory you've been on. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I came out of PT school knowing that I was most interested in kind of orthopedics and sports medicine. So I had planned on starting there. It was the closest thing to exercise science, which was my original kind of passion before that was my undergrad degree was exercise science. And it grew up as an athlete. So I wanted to be in that realm and orthopedics and sports medicine, you know, 
as you can imagine, all the different facets of PT was the closest one to kind of exercise physiology, exercise science. And I was in an outpatient clinic and it only took, it really was in the first year I realized this isn't going to work for me long term. Um, it just, was you know you know it's so monotonous you can't hear the grin on my face yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's so monotonous you're you know you're just you're just dying slowly it's um it's a sad right and there's a lot of pts who are really dissatisfied and depressed in that setting by the system that's right big time a big time i mean yeah the the system just really and you know we talk about this in the intro of the book quite a bit it's just you as a PT, even if you love the information and love treating patients and helping them, the system is set up that you just can't really provide quality care. And so I just, I knew I wasn't going to last in that for a long period of time. And so I also knew that I loved education. So I had this goal of, I wanted to try, my first thought was I need to have a change and I want to move towards education. And so Kirsten, my wife's a PT as well. And we went and did traveling PT. We just, I mean, what actually happened is we went on a vacation to the Galapagos Islands and realized we could never go back to our jobs. We were like, we have to quit. So we went back, put in our notice. And so I only ended up being in a traditional clinic for two years and then left. We went to travel PT for a year. I did the, the, it worked as for Cirque du Soleil for a little while. Um, as a, and I was just kind of, I was bouncing around a little bit, trying to find things that were, had an education portion to it, but we're also just stimulating because the clinic was just so boring to me. I tell people all the time, I love talking about physical therapy. I don't actually like practicing that much. So, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, the first, the first appointment with people is fun, but after that, I don't really want to do much anymore. It's fun. As an aside, as a young therapist, you see evals booked on evaluations, booked on your schedule and you're just terrified. Mm -hmm. They take so much time. But then once you sort of in the system, you're like, you thank goodness for these. For, I want, all I want to do is evals and hand them over. I mean, like, because that's exactly. really the, the interesting mm-hmm. hypothesis driving, getting to understand someone. The complexity is really rich in that first meeting. Yeah. And, and I don't want to um, put words in your mouth, but my guess is some of the things that were difficult for you in the system, you know, we know about because we've obviously been around physical therapy for so long, but it's, you know, short visits, not enough visits, not enough resources to do things with patients that actually make change and make a difference for them. You know, and I think a lot of that is very similar to what physicians actually, many physicians yeah, even, complain about. Even the of expectations now. of the yeah. person coming you know, they're just, I don't know what, what I'm doing here, right? I expect you to fix me very quickly. I'm exactly. not very invested in understanding the bigger project. And it's, it's, it puts everyone at a disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And is that what, I mean, is that what you experienced? Is that, oh, was that, totally. you know, is that, the, were those things what killed your joy uh, in, in terms of being a, a practitioner of? Yeah. Therapy? No, it's everything you guys are talking about. I mean, I think, the educator in me was really excited about those evals and then I would be really bored in follow-up sessions and really not want to do them. I was seeing, you know, you're seeing 15 people a day. It was too many people. You're just rushing from one to the next. There's all the paperwork. You're stressed out. You don't feel like you, the way the system is set up with those short visits, you don't feel like you're really making that big of a difference. Sometimes I feel like I need to talk to people for that whole time before I can even start doing anything, you know? So and you do. You do, right? I mean, people, especially- That's appropriate. In, yeah, totally. I mean, in pain, that relationship and the rapport and people need to be able to tell their story. And, you know, I still, to this day, I've backed off on, I still see a few patients here and there because I think it helps keep me in the game a little bit. It keeps me fresh on questions and common problems, but I see everyone for an hour now. It's all self-pay. And I think like you were talking about, Kelly, when people come in and have to, when it's self-pay, there's a different, it's like they come into it with the mindset of, I need to take some responsibility for my own health and I'm going to be doing something. I'm going to do whatever they tell me I need to do because this is a sacrifice to pay cash to come to this appointment versus use my health insurance. I think in the normal health insurance model, the PTs often checked out because they're like, whatever, I'm just going to get patients. I don't even have to market like people. There's a line for eight weeks and the patient. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's no out, there's no connection to your performance and their, their outcomes as patients, right? Like it doesn't, you know, you can work on someone for six weeks and make literally zero change and you're going to get paid the same amount from the insurance company. Right. It's so true that people are just going to keep coming. You could just ultrasound everyone's back, no matter what they have. And you'd still get paid the same and people's keep coming. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, <laughs> let's start a business together. <laughs> the counterclockwise ultrasound bros. Exactly. I love it. I, I'm I in. Can, I you can... specialize in clockwise. I'll specialize in counterclockwise. <laughs> exactly. I'll just say, 
that um, one thing that I'm sure resonated significantly with Kelly was, um, you know, and, and it's interesting how similar your journeys are, right? Mm. Kelly, I think worked at a traditional physical therapy clinic for a little less than two months. years. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, he, he made it almost as long as you did. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, he had all of those challenges and issues. And I think maybe chief among them might have been the paperwork, mm -hmm. right? That was, um, you know, his, his, his skill set was talking to people and connecting and understanding their problems and doing the manual therapy and coaching, right? And his skill set didn't necessarily, or, or at least his excitement level, um, did not include sitting down for hours and hours and hours at night after seeing 15 patients writing notes that seemed well, pointless. And the note, just so everyone understands, it's important to document your thinking, particularly if someone else is coming along or, yeah. or you need to know what you what worked and didn't work. Right. So you can ha have a, a trail. So that, that's not what we're saying. And, and whether you keep soap notes or not, the documentation exists currently not for communication, but for validation for the insurance company. Right. And I think that's, right, right, that's right. really it's, what people understand. That's right. Care. And it yeah. really ends up feeling like, mm, I don't know if this is serving the patient. It's serving the physio, serving the process, but it is certainly serving that I've proven that I got another five degrees and so can get, you know what I mean? Like it, it, it's really separate from the system. It's a weird third party validation yeah. model. Yeah. If the, yes. if the note were purely just to document what you did with the patient. So you, you know, at that next session, this is what I did last time. This is where we were at. And it, we do the coaching. We co we, yeah. we write what we did and what happened. I mean, that's, you know, that's, the, that's a coaching model that right. that doesn't, shouldn't be a, a, a step for anyone. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. But when it feels like you're just doing notes to try and get reimbursed and jump through all these hurt, jump over all these hurdles for the insurance company, I agree. It's, it just, it's not what I had planned on doing as a physical therapist. Now you see all these memes like this is what I thought I was doing and it's just and then this is what I actually do and it's just paperwork all the time. The drowning <laughs> hand and then yeah, like yeah, the yeah, insurance yeah. company and high fives the hand. Yeah, I mean I think that that's professionally very common. You know, before mm -hmm. I went into the health and fitness space, I was an attorney and I mean not a single law student um, you know, every law student goes to school thinking they're going to be at trial and in the courtroom and wearing their suit and making arguments and doing all these things that you see on TV. And then it's the same. I mean, you become an attorney and you're that's, locked. That's marriage. That's yeah, yeah. You're locked. You know, you're locked in an office reviewing documents and you know reading. Email. I mean, it's it's yeah. so similar. I think right. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, I think those posts are helpful to at least help the young. Question for you before Kelly guesses. Yeah. Do do you think there's anything any of us can like, how do we change this model? I mean, mm. it's such a behemoth. You know, we have some people out there like Danny Mate and his team who are doing amazing work at PT mastermind, mm -hmm. you know, teaching physical therapists how to run cash based clinics. So I think that that's one way to do it is just mm -hmm. to work outside the system, you know, but, but man, I mean, the system's there and, and for many people, that's all they can afford. And, to do. and, I mean, it, can, and it can be appropriate sometimes Like you're in a hospital, that care can be yeah. make total sense. It's almost like we yeah. need a, a divergent system that there's we're in this very acute physical care we're working at wounds and managing and looking at fevers yeah. and all these other things and then there's like oh you need performance yeah and i mean now. it is mm -hmm. like people need to be get you know they need to be helped getting out of bed after surgery i mean there's some really like critical things and you know and there's also that sort of like re immediate post-surgical window you know the six weeks i think yeah. when people are acutely post-surgical it's super helpful but yeah i mean that that so anyway and i don't know i just wonder if you had any thoughts about you know, the system writ large. I, I mean, it's such a complex beast. I don't know. I mean, I just honestly try not to look at it anymore. <laughs> I'm just a denial. Oh. Um, I, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think most of my focus has been on just trying uh, that cash pay, self pay, like what can I do to separate myself from this? Cause mm -hmm. to me, it just seems like, I don't know how you get past I mean, of course, you could say, well, well, let's have some evidence and research and show the insurance companies like this is the way we should do things or, you know, even yeah, that, looking at I just don't think you're going to sway them. I just I think it at the end of the day, that system is going to follow the money and be incentivized. I, I don't know how you change it. To me, it feels like a very intimidating task. And, you know, I always feel like maybe the APTA and some of these organizations, hopefully they have like teams that are working. I, they do. I just, I think I've listened to you guys talk a little bit. I think you have better insights into it than I do. I, I honestly left and didn't look back. <laughs> well, let me, t you didn't look back, but you didn't leave. Let mm -hmm. me just set that up for everyone. Mm -hmm. This book is really important. 
and look, I, I may or may not have been the black sheep of my physical therapy school for sure. You know, day one, I was like asking really difficult questions and, you know, just I opened a gym. I was just suddenly was like, Hey, I think there's something else here. But one of the things I love about this book and why this book is so important is that it actually gets us to skilled care. Mm. So what I feel like is that the system is set up when you go already, it's a strange issue. No one just blindly chooses a dentist they've never met before. Like you get referral. Like, would you let a total stranger cut your hair, Lisa? Yes. I'm just going to just show up and be like, hey, I'm at Supercuts, cut my hair. That works for like a child. That does not work for an adult. And that is our current, our current model. And so the issue is that there's so much gap between understanding someone's experience, understanding their history, understanding their motivation. And hey, I got three visits to fix this problem because that's all the insurance is going to pay for and you, you are incentivized, et cetera. But what this book does is it gives people the first shot that if you went to a traditional physical therapist, 100% of this book are the photocopies, hopefully not the photocopies. They're the exercises you would get plus the explanation you would get. What are you, you talking about? Get. They're dittos. <laughs> Mimeographs. You could sniff them. But this is what you should be getting before you even have your first appointment. And I, I think that's what's really remarkable about this. Because if I come in, I'm like, hey, my knee's been hurting. And it's obviously been hurting so bad that I can no longer occupy my role in society. I can't do my job. It's interrupting my, my relationship and my family. Now I'm going to go see my doctor. Now I'm going to get a referral. There was a lot of steps in there and a lot of time that gets missed. This isn't like, hey, I, my knee hurts and I run and I go see Tom that afternoon. That's the model we'd love to have, but that's not how the model works. And what you've done here, just for everyone, while, while this is so important, is that this is a simple, at-home, subversive blueprint of sound thinking, movement theory, and exercises to solve very common musculoskeletal problems. And if you do these things, chances are you're going to feel better because these things work very well. They're well validated, well clinically reasoned. And then if you don't get success, you go see a pro. Mm -hmm. And what I feel like is that your approach to this has really given you enough advantage to say, hey, look, let's go ahead and take up all this low slack out of the system, which should never have been there in the first place, mm -hmm. which is what drove me crazy. I'm like, you're actually not delivering skilled care. You're not having doctoral level conversations. You're not even able to tap into all of the advanced clinical reasoning that we potentially could deliver to someone. You, I'm just giving you some low level movements that you should know how to do because we have the internet. So let me say that you never left the profession. In mm -hmm. fact, you've skipped us into actually being able to pro progress what we want to do. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I agree. I think, you know, when you look at the evidence and the research around musculoskeletal conditions, the things that have the strongest evidence are education and exercise slash movement. And so I think, you know, I use a lot of manual therapy. They're talking about my residency was in manual therapy after PT school. And I still really value that in the beginning and working with patients uh, for, you know, for lots of different conditions. But I think with something like a book, you can learn about pain and injury and you can learn the movements that tend to help that condition. And I think, you know, those things at once upon a time when I was new as a PT, I would have thought each person really needs these highly tailored specific exercises. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the longer I'm <laughs> in quads. Yeah. I realize I saw this thing the other day, you know, it's like, you know how we say special tests aren't that special. It's like exercises aren't that special either. I mean, I think sometimes if you just get people moving and it's not threatening their pain system, you're just moving kind of in the region where their symptoms are and you give it some time, most people get better. And so I think, you know, something like a book, you can kind of learn like, well, what are some soft tissue mobilizations I can kind of use to reduce some pain? What are some stretches and mobility exercises I can use to start some low load kind of movements to start introducing a little more challenge to the system. And then I can end with resistance training that helps build capacity in that area. And that's all stuff I can look at pictures and videos and learn how to do. And like you said, if I don't improve or if I have some sort of red flag symptom that seems more serious, well, of course, it's like it's not meant to tell you not to go to PT, but now you're at least you at least have some information. So you're going into that situation better prepared. And everyone, if you show up to your physio appointment and you're like, here's what I've been doing, 
I've read this thing on pain science. I understand. I've been working on my sleep and nutrition. Here are some mobilizations. I've been working on desensitizing and restoring motion. What do you think the problem is? Their head is going to explode. My mind you will be blown. You need to be a much better that. patient. And that's what you're actually empowering people to do is be better patients. And what's the old maxim? If you want good outcomes, choose great patients. I mean, I think that's a surgery model, right? <laughs> Sounds so, right. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, this may be premature, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you the billion dollar question. Um, because this is how the, we, you know, if you have an answer to this, this is how we're all going to pay our mortgages for the rest of our oh, lives. Dude, what is this? Um, how come you didn't tell me this question? I'm getting how, intimidated. And we've been trying to answer this question mm. since we began. How do you get people to care <laughs> to do these things before they get to the point where they do need to wave the flag and actually go see a physician or PT or chiropractor and spend their money, you know, because I think for us, that's always the billion dollar question. You know, we've been working for years trying to tell people, Hey, there's a lot you can do on your living room floor. You can, you know, there's resources like your book and our books and many other people out there doing good work in this way that are trying to empower people to, to sort of make that connection that man, like you don't have to live with nagging pain. You don't have to wait until you're catastrophically injured. There's a lot that you can be doing now. Mm -hmm. And you know, things like your range of motion. Besides which, making this book naked and filling it with bourbon. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's the billion dollar question, you know, yeah. how do you get people to care? And yeah. is this, you know, this is a struggle for us and I, I assume for you, but what, what's your take on that? Yeah, it is such a tricky thing. I mean, I'm not immune to it either. Like I'm sure I will have something that's kind of bothering me and I'll let it go for a long time before. I mean, I'm a freaking PT and I'm doing that. So it's, you know, I will eventually implement something when it's been around long enough and becomes frustrating enough. I'll finally modify what's aggravating it. And, you know, but I think it is, um, you know, I think when people come in with pain and injuries, obviously by the time they come and seek care, they're already pretty motivated. So it's just the education of how and why, and that helps people because as we know, adherence isn't good, even when people do come to PT and seek care. And I think I'm in a little bit more of a unique model where as soon as people are in that self pay model, like I said, I think they're, they want to take more response. They're already in the mindset of taking kind of extra responsibility for their care. So I haven't found adherence to be as much of an issue anymore, but I think, you know, in those insurance models, that system that is because the, the patient doesn't care much. The PT doesn't care much. It's just, nobody's really taking responsibility for that situation. And, in those settings, even with good education, you know, it's still challenging. And those are people who already are, have already decided to seek care. So they're already somewhat more motivated. The person who's at home who hasn't started seeking care, I don't know, outside of scaring them, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I think I do, I, you know, looking at like Peter Atia's stuff recently, I think sometimes you, you guys are not, we've all talked about this, like that, that, um, the test from standing to the floor and back up, right? Like I think sometimes linking things to mortality and potential detriments in functional independence, you know, it's like if you lose a bunch of quad strength, well, this could affect you in these negative ways from a functional standpoint, longevity overall, overall. I don't, I wonder sometimes if those types of pieces of information yeah. would help people versus just the, I think sometimes the normal PT educational information isn't serious enough for people to get motivated. It's like, uh, well, I've got this nagging pain and maybe it could interfere with these couple of functional tasks and, but it's not strong enough to motivate them to make that change until it gets severe enough that it really interferes with the things they really want to do. But I, it's a good question. I don't know that I have the perfect answer either besides maybe relating it to more sin, like more serious things in life. You know, I don't know. This episode of the Ready State Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. Look, I got to cut in hey. and, and point out hey. something has changed with you. Yeah, and and the, the thing that's changed is that I've started drinking a scoop of Momentus Vital Aminos before I work out in the morning. Dude, t tell me more because I have been on the Vital Aminos, Essential Aminos tip for a second. Tell me why you decided to come over to the cool kid side. So, you know, when you're a kid and your parents tell you, like, you get in trouble with your parents and you don't really listen to them, they kind no. of are like, womp, womp, womp. No. But then when, like, your, like, friend's dad gets mad at you, you remember that forever. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a similar situation here in that, you know, you for years have been suggesting maybe I should eat 
more than a cappuccino before I work out in the morning. But it wasn't until my dear friend Kyla of Nutritional Revolution <clears throat> suggested that Expert I might get more out of my workouts. A mile away. <laughs> this is crap. I might get more out of my workouts. And so I have been drinking a scoop of vital aminos before I work out in the morning along with my cappuccino. There, and I will there, say I feel good and I feel like my workouts are better. Yeah, and the reason we're trying to do that is making sure that we're not accidentally spending muscle tissue to fuel, to start to repair by having those essential aminos, you're not eating a lot. It's easy. It's not, it's not like you're going out on a full stomach, but you're covered sort of the essential basics of making sure that you have all those circulating aminos so that when you start calling for them, you're not, you're not accidentally tearing down your muscle to exercise. And one side benefit is that I used to just drink a cappuccino and have zero water also before I work out. So just having this, when you know, one scoop of vital aminos and some water has also been great. But I'm with you. Sometimes I don't like to, I don't like to have a big meal in my stomach before I go train this way. At least I know I'm covered until I can get to that protein carb afterwards yeah and i think it really is making a big difference in how i feel when i'm training Forget, so, dude, you're I mean, shredded and it's sort of annoying <laughs> and you're getting more shredded and more annoying well maybe it's the vital aminos if you want to find out about juliet's amazing transformation <laughs> of behavior go to livemomentous.com slash trs and use code trs for 20 percent off your first purchase this episode of the ready state podcast is brought to you by yeti i was just traveling teaching at a place called the FBI <laughs> and there was in a, a place called Quantico Quantico and the physical therapist there had a yonder and I was like oh I know that bottle tell me why you switched f from your sort of insulated bottle insulated bo bomb proof bottle to a yonder and what she said was I really like being able to see how much of water I've consumed in the day who knew who knew and I'll, I'll tell you sometimes you're like I don't know some, but I do think there's a behavior piece there for people. If you're struggling to drink water, being able to sort of measure as you go, I think that's really relevant. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out is they also have created this really cool new tether cap, which is my go-to cap on all of my yonder bottles. And you know, you could even clip it onto stuff with a carabiner. Shoot, people want. are literally like, "Look at the tether cap on that girl." <laughs> it's a really awesome new way to enjoy your yonder bottle, and more importantly, the most leak-proof of all time ever. Because when I slip this thing next to my computer, I think to myself, no problem. No problem. I'll gamble this. That Yonder bottle is the shiz. It's what I travel with. And uh, it was really fun to see it in the wild with someone who's saying, this is the reason. And it was one of the reasons we loved when, when they were putting it out, we're like, we can see how much water we're drinking. True fact. Look, if you want to know more, go to thereadystate.com slash Yeti. Dentists made the case that, you know, if you did better to care of your teeth. You came in for regular checkups. We could prevent a whole lot of problems. I think people started to get that message. I think that was marketing. Yeah. Right. But do you think there's any preventative care model for a physical therapist? Like what if everybody went and saw a physical therapist twice a year no. as a matter of course, it'd be a waste of time. But, but what if they were like, you know, they did some like movement tests and analysis yeah, sure. and they were said, okay, yeah. Like you can't get up on, up, up on, you know, you can't get up off the ground. So you we, need to do these things. We just interviewed right? Dan Butner, who was, who popularized and really, made this concept of blue zone hmm. sort of international. And one of the things that he's spent a lot of his time doing as he just reported is he's actually working with municipalities about reshaping the environment. And I suspect at one level, one of the problems the three of us are talking about is that our lives don't actually require native range of motion. They don't require physicality and our bodies are so tolerant. We can really like, you can ride this thing hard, put it away wet, eat little chocolates, donuts, have a cigarette, win a world championship. Like it's an awesome machine. And then the world doesn't require you to do anything. If you had to walk all the time mm -hmm. or, you know, you'd be good at walking. If, if your environment was set up in a way that you, if you couldn't engage in your environment, suddenly you'd be like, I better get on that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I can't go up and down these stairs. But otherwise I think the issue is that, you know, until the environment changes and or people start really realizing that you know we're aging and i can't do what i want to do when i'm 60 and now i'm you know it's yeah. going to take a while i feel like the glacial pace is the breakneck pace but i think i think you both bring up a really good point yeah no i agree i think like you said with the dentist relating it to kind of long-term detriments in health maybe you know i mean but it's hard right it's hard in our world i think their research it's easier to link it to some long you know that like you said the musculoskeletal system is so resilient and adaptable that some people could do something 
you know, could avoid certain things with their system training wise or mobility work and they end up being fine. And then other people, maybe they're more likely to develop certain issues. It's hard to, it's hard to predict with certainty what's going to happen. But I think, you know, I mean, even the book, we went back and forth on calling it rehab science because you don't want people to get in this mindset of, oh, I only use this when I actually have pain or a problem because we know all those exercises, resistance training and mobility exercises, I'm using those all the time just in my general workouts. Like I, they're not, they're not only reserved for having pain or an injury. They help keep your musculoskeletal system healthy. And I think the thing that I feel like, especially with resistance training, I think sometimes it's easier. I think more and more people are getting interested in strength training and resistance training. I think it's easier to, I think people can more easily visualize if I pick things heavy, heavy things up and get stronger and my muscles and tendons and all these tissues become thicker and stronger, that is going to make those tissues more resilient and I'm less likely to be injured. I feel like people can see that line of logic. And yeah, that one's been a little easier for me to kind of get people behind these kind of rehab type interventions. But it's, uh, well, and like you said too, Kelly, our life, I sometimes, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us, I kind of worry about what's going to happen to us as humans because, Oh, it's Wally. It's, it's, it's already happening. It's bad. It's so, you know, it's like all these, we're all so comfortable and life doesn't demand much from us from a physical standpoint. And I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie, uh, was it idiocracy? The one where like everyone is basically just becomes dumb and is completely sedentary and you know, there's one guy who has average intelligence, but he's viewed as a genius. And, you know, I just, I think that's, I worry that's where we're heading, but yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know how you change it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I know your guy, you guys are talking a lot about this in the book It just, you know, things like getting enough steps per day and just making sure you, and you see this everywhere now. It's like, it's some, it's not often good enough just to have your hour of workout and then sit all day. You've got to be moving more than that. And, but well, I just, yeah, and- I just saw the definitive research that, one hour workout intensely eight hours of sitting cancels it out. Yeah. I mean, we, we got so much pushback from people being like, it doesn't matter. I'm elite. I can lay on the couch yeah. and Julian are like, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and you know, I just, physiology is supposed to work. Yeah. I just want to echo what you said about the strength training, resistance training thing though. I do think, you know, sometimes I can be really critical about the sort of fire hose of internet information and people are confused. And, you know, that was one of the motivations in, in our case for writing built to move was just to create try vital to, signs, just to create some simple vital signs. Right. And, and give people a resource that was easy and accessible. And, but I do think, one, you know, to give kudos to our industry, you know, if I include physical therapy and health fitness sort of generally is I do think we've done a good job of changing people's perception, especially women of strength training and resistance training, yeah, that's true. That's really you know, and the, the, I just was on this industry panel earlier today and, you know, the data is actually, the data is actually supporting that, that more and more women are reporting that they want to, and are doing resistance training and are signing up and paying for gyms in order to be able to do that. So I think, you know, that's a really positive change. I think, you know, I just wanted to sort of echo what you said. Like, I do think that piece is starting to click through for people that they are realizing that, you know, if they want to be able to do the things they want to do when they get older that, you know, resistance strength training is going to need to be part of that picture. So I think, you know, kudos, kudos to the larger community for that. I think that's really changing. And I think that's a part of physical therapy. I mean, right. That's like, it's this whole continuum of movement. And I think ultimately if you get people motivated to exercise, you're essentially kind of, you know, I mean, that's a big part of physical therapy. It's just physical therapy ends up being a little bit more specific therapy. I mean, specific therapy to exercise and these other interventions, but so many people, I'm just trying to encourage them just to move more in general and just exercise. And I think when you see things like that, where people are getting more excited about resistance training or different types of exercise, I mean, I think, I feel like there's so much on the internet right now about health span and longevity and all this stuff. And, you know, Dr. T has done an awesome job of promoting exercise. And to me, if something promotes exercise, that ultimately promotes what we're doing in physical therapy, I think in a lot of ways. So, you know, I, I, to me, you know, that's a positive. And I, I think, you know, maybe it's just, sometimes it's just that maybe it's a, maybe it's tackling and kind of targeting exercises versus, versus these kind of what might come off as very specific rehab kind of physical therapy. Mm. It's tricky though. Let me ask you this. Um, in writing this book and putting it together, what surprised you or what did you come about in your understanding? 
I think, you know, as, as I went through it, um, well, there, there are aspects of just the writing a book process that were surprising, <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot on that side of things that I didn't really anticipate and Glenn kept trying to warn me, but, um, I just was like, oh, sure. I got it. No, no big deal. I, but, um, you know, on the content side, the book, I think what the probably the most interesting part to me was the chapter 13, the CAMS chapter, the complementary and alternative medicine section, because I went back through all this research on all these different interventions that people ask about, you know, acupuncture, cupping, stem cell, PRP. It was really interesting. Actually, for like a month, I just would wake up and go on PubMed and go through each one and just try to find the most relevant current research related to these different interventions. So I think that was, it didn't really change my mindset of how I look at those things. To me, they're, I always tell people like, as long as you are incorporating, you're making the exercise and movement, the that stuff your priority. If you want to try adding some of these things on top, I'm okay with that. You know, if you want to add acupuncture to these types of interventions or add cupping or, you know, add something like that to these things, and that's okay. So it didn't really change my mindset there, but it was interesting to go back. That was probably where I had the most surprises going back to that research and just kind of refreshing my knowledge on cool. when do these things fit in. That was probably the biggest thing in terms of the content. The rest of it, I mean, it was just writing the book was actually just really a good opportunity overall to go through the research again, because, you know, it's easy when you're busy all the time. There's so much research to sit down and have a dedicated window where you just look at all the current studies like that doesn't happen for me very often. No. In fact, I rely on my friends, Flexibility Research, Brent Brookbush, you know, uh, you know, bio lane, like people who are really deep in there, I really heavily consume their, their information because it's their experts mm -hmm. and they love to do this as part of their job. So they, they yep. do a lot of it for me, which I really appreciate. Let me ask you this, what has been, or the reception of physical therapists mm -hmm. who are all very enlightened and very open and love to support each other. Have like, I only saw this book and cheered. And I think I told you right away. I think I DM'd you and I was like, thank you for it. I yes. never want to write this book. I didn't want to touch this book. I'm so glad you did it. Did you have a similar experience as mine with other physios? I, you know, I, I thought it would be, I thought I would be attacked more, honestly. And I have had some of that. But I think because the book was so similar to what I was already doing online, all those attacks had already happened. You know? <laughs> so Skin people, was yeah, people, you know, cause I do get a lot of, um, you know, you're not evaluating the patient and you're putting these exercises out there and you know, it's not specific to anyone. It's not Glenn shells could explode a pelvis. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> okay. It's totally, that people were, Glenn shells, by the way, are my, my current thing to just rag on. Yeah. Yeah. As an, as an allegory for, they're like, a good one to go after. It's great. Um, I mean, clamshells are great. I'm just saying that like, you're so worried that people are so fragile. They can't do a clamshell, but they get mm -hmm, out of their car. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like, you know what I mean, I'm like, hello. Yeah. It's a clamshell. No, it's true. Yeah. Most of these things are all pretty low load. It's like when you consider what everyone Safe. else, what they're, what someone else is doing in life. Like I think the right. risk of getting injured from these is it's pretty dang low. So yeah, I think I, it actually has gone, you know, I think sometimes also the PTs just don't, they aren't saying as much it most of the comments are from people who have the issues and are getting the book and so that's been positive i mean i have had a few people that are sort of like shouldn't the person go see a pt and get specific you know a specific program nope. tailored to their issue and i just let me just say that again nope you should take a crack at it yourself in your own home before you activate the medical system i agree i mean and i that this has really been a transition for me in probably the last six years because probably prior to being on social yeah. media i would have said oh yeah, like you really need to go see someone and have an, a program, custom program created for your issues and your symptoms. But now as I've been on here longer, I really have seen how not special exercise is to some degree. I mean, you want, like I say, you want, therapeutic exercises can be really powerful when you get, you know, if you've got a back pain issue, you can get some of these kind of specific therapeutic exercises for the back region in general. It really can help people, but it doesn't, I think what I've seen in social media is that you don't always have to have that evaluation. If you kind of rule out the serious stuff. Yeah. The you, red flags and you, you do a great job of teaching people 
here is what we think immediately. It's not even physical therapist is physician related. Like you need to go to the ER. Exactly. Exactly. Once you rule out those kind of red flag medical conditions, then yeah, like you said, take a, take a swing at it. Like most things with time and movements that get you in the right area and challenge those tissues are going to get you better. I mean, there's all this research on regression to the mean, you know, I mean, most practice people are just getting better over time with most musculoskeletal conditions without intervention. And the practitioner will usually take credit for it because the person's getting better, you know, and really it might just be time, but oh, it's this intervention I'm doing is making it better. Who knows? Yeah, you just laughed know, at me because. No, I was laughing because last year, for the first time in my life, I went through this phase of having low back pain. And, you know, I've had some weird health issues and stuff, but like by and large, I haven't really had that many musculoskeletal Julia, injuries. Juliet, let me just everyone is a musculoskeletal unicorn. <laughs> She doesn't feel pain. She can go hard. She can throw herself at walls. She's a three-time world champion. She can lift deadlift every single day. And she's just like, yeah, my calves are a little stiff. But but I will say I got this low back pain thing and it was persistent. And you know, you can get your I started to get into that sort of psychological spiral that so many people with any pain, but I think probably particularly low back pain get into of like, oh my God, this is my future. This is my life. I'm this is how I'm gonna have to live. I'm gonna Juliet never had to low back ache from doing nothing except Squatting, running, deadlifting, biking. So, so, but Kelly said to me, I will say this was this was important. I'm about to give you a compliment, baby. Thanks, babe. Um, he said, hey, most low back pain re resolves on its own in six to eight weeks. Nice. And he just said that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was interesting is literally like seven weeks to the day. I mean, of course, I did a bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like I tried, you know, I, I. She was super stressed also. I yeah. did some stuff associated yep. with it. But literally at like the seven week and one day mark to the day, I woke up and I'm like, oh, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I, I'm just saying that I really relate to what, what you're saying there. You know, that, yeah. that I, I, you know, obviously we can all throw, we can throw a lot of things at pain. And, and I would love to talk with you actually more about this broader subject of pain, but we can throw a lot of things at it. But yeah, I mean, you know, human beings are pretty amazing and pretty hardy and able to heal themselves. One sure. of the shifts I think has been really great for everyone is we've been having a lot more nuanced conversations of pain mm -hmm. and helping people. And we can talk about explain pain and the great work that, you know, um, body keeps a score. All of the pain educators have just, you know, my physio school talked a lot about pain science mm -hmm. and, and, you know, everyone had come out of the Folsom course and, you know, really understood and talked differently about pain and, one of the things that I really appreciate is that you really do a great job and I think have a, an entire section just helping people understand and reframe that. And I think the price of admission for this book is actually if everyone just read that chapter, mm -hmm. they could we could expand this conversation of, hey, it's going to be okay. This is a signal. Mm -hmm. You probably don't have rabies. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And I, I just want to give you kudos for that. Well, thank yeah, you. And I mean, yeah. Maybe you, maybe you could just give us like a little sort of Reader's Digest version of what your approach, you know, to rethinking pain is. And mm -hmm. I don't want to use the book, the other book title, but, um, yeah. but yeah, what, what is your thinking and your approach? Because I agree with Kelly. I think it, you know, we've been going around saying, you know, pain is a request for change and, mm -hmm. you know, trying in our own way to help people sort of reframe what pain means, but mm -hmm. we'd love to hear what your thinking and approach is. Yeah, no, I like what you guys have been saying. I think that request for a change is a good way to look at it. I think, you know, you know, when somebody comes in, whether if I've had pain or someone comes in here into the clinic and has pain, everybody varies, right? Like your approach to pain education is totally different depending on the person and where they're at and yeah. how they feel about pain. But you do get people who are worried and anxious about it and wondering what it's going to mean long term for them. Are they going to be able to keep doing the things they like to do? It affects their mental health in a lot of cases, right? Like you see so many people that when they have pain and can't exercise, that ends up causing some depression because they're really bummed out not getting to do these things they like to do. And so I think to me, you know, and it's interesting now, there's some newer research showing that pain education, there's some studies showing that it hasn't been that effective. So I think it really is person to person and it's probably kind of hard to study. But you do, you, right, you get some people who come in and they have pain. They're like, I'll just do whatever. I just want to get over this. And they're not really, it's not stressing them out that much. And then you get some people who are really stressed out about it. They're hyper vigilant. They can't stop focusing on it. And I think those types of people, what I've found is, you know, kind of that request to change type concept of trying to help people reframe this as your, as like a threat you know, pain is related to threat and it's ultimately this survival mechanism to keep you alive basically. But sometimes that pain can be accurate and sometimes it can be inaccurate and just basically trying to help people understand 
what is pain? How does that pain system work from kind of a basic physiological level? But I think probably sometimes the thing that I think is the most helpful with people is what we covered in chapter four, which are all the factors that influence pain. Because I think- Yeah, it's a great people, diagram. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate how many things can influence their nervous system. They think if I have physical pain, if I have pain in my physical body, it's just related to my posture, anatomy, biomechanics, all these things we used to talk about. Like when I came out of PT school, it was my program was definitely very heavy in posture, structure, biomechanics. And right, those things are still really important. There's a, a lot of people's pain is very much related to their tissues and forces and all that stuff. But I think appreciating some of these other things like sleep and what's your nutrition look like and how stressed are you? What kind of thoughts and beliefs do you have about pain? You know, has somebody told you that? you know, this pain means such and such a thing that really freaks you out, or it's never going to go away. Or, you know, your dad had a bad back. So that means you're going to have a bad back, you know, just these thoughts and beliefs, or I saw another practitioner and they told me all my pain is because my legs are unequal in length or my pelvis is off. And I, you know, just people carry a lot of harmful beliefs around. And so those mess, those kind of beliefs and narratives and things, um, were a big part of, why I even got into pain science in the beginning, having patients come in and me feeling frustrated for what they had been told and how that was affecting them in a harmful way. So I think a lot of it... Wait, are you saying that all of those factors can't be addressed in a 30-minute visit? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Easy. No problem. Nailed it. <laughs> There's so, a type yeah, one error in that whole system. I mean, that's really that's why. Where you just put your hands together. That's and right. Magic happens. And they sleep, and then they eat better, and then you you unmess up their work schedules, and then you you spend thirty years talking about their family. I mean, three seconds. Well, I think a lot of people, you know, that's the first five chapters of the book, and then it goes into injury and kind of because you know injury and pain, of course, can be really similar and can share a lot of things, but they can be different, right? Like we know people who have injuries that have no pain and have pain, and you can't identify an injury and trying to. Kind of separate. I think most people are gonna. Most people are just excited about getting into the programs and having something they can do for whatever issue they have. But right. I keep hoping that people, once they're in there, it will be they'll want to. They'll say like, "Huh, I wonder why this is working or why I'm doing this." And then they'll go back to the earlier chapters because I know for me, and I'm sure you guys feel this way, knowing having some education about pain and injury, I think is protective in a way. I don't, you know, if I have some. I feel really, it's amazing to me that we don't teach more kinesiology. Like my kids are 12 and nine and we don't teach kinesiology or much about anatomy or the body just generally in school. I mean, it's this thing you're carrying with you for your whole life and people don't understand, people understand hardly anything about it. And if, so whenever I have a small symptom or something, I'm like, oh, my shoulder hurts right here. I probably just, I did this thing yesterday. I probably just irritated, whatever, I irritated my rotator cuff a little bit or something. And I don't worry about it. I've got a plan of attack for kind of, some principles to help me guide me through managing that issue. And I think my hope is that the information will give people that same kind of foundation to just whatever comes up in life with whatever pain or injury I've got, I've got kind of this mindset, this education that changes my mindset. So I know how to work through it. And not panic. You know, um, we love, I just was talking with our friend, Michael Easter, you mm -hmm. know, and he, his book, the comfort crisis, this is really important idea is that we actually haven't been uncomfortable or suffered physically. Yeah. I think a lot of people suffer emotionally, but this physical threat of suffering, which is what pain really is, we don't have a place to put it or a way to reference it or be in a relationship around it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people are understanding. I mean, I just saw some quote that was just like, you know, a few minutes of breathing and holding your breath, you know, deeply like Wim Hof is like produces more norepinephrine than jumping off a bridge. Mm -hmm. And so if you can elicit some of these fear responses, pain responses, uncomfortable, get sauna, I get hot, I get cold, I'm on the bike suffering. I think then when your knee hurts a little bit, you're like, well, that's not bad. It's just my knee hurts a little bit. But if you have none of that as a reference and then something sh shows up, it really feels catastrophic mm -hmm. because you're blindsided by this, this new event and you have changed nothing in your life, right? I think that's what's like, what has happened? I, I'm doing the same terrible things that I've always done, but now my knee hurts. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, like we talk about graded exposure when people have pain, right? Like you're exposing them to something threatening, threatening and graded doses. Well, we should be doing that in life when we're not in pain. I mean, I think those things are protective, just like you talked about thermal stresses like sauna and ice baths. Exer I think that's probably one of the major influences of exercise is you're, you're 
exposing your system to a stress. I mean, I grew up doing martial arts. I think back when I did judo in high school, we were just throwing each other all the time. That really helped probably now I think back on it desensitized my system. Like I always think I used to joke about this. I'm like, we should take people with chronic pain and put them in judo and we'll slowly, it'll oh, be you a think you're in pain. I'll give you something to be in pain about. <laughs> exactly. We'll have a judo pain program. And uh, you, know, you, you, um, you really, that, I, 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 let me just double click on that because that is so important. What you're saying I is that these, judo story. The, I will, but these early exposures that you're talking about, I think are crucial. And what you really start to get into is what is the education around pain? through experience and where do we start that i think that's a really great convo so i have to tell you a quick story um i think it was when kelly was actually in physical therapy school and um uh, we before be that with judo we yeah we became friends with some um san francisco some guys in the san francisco police department and they were playing judo and so kelly started going with them and they may have been olympians and <laughs> they were i mean kelly's a big dude but these were some big I strong kelly, dudes. i held his own yeah. And, um, and he'd done, you know, Kelly had a history of doing a little bit of martial arts as, as a kid and, and stuff. So, you know, he wasn't a total noob, but there was this morning he woke up and where he'd been laying on the bed, there were like 27 like blood marks from all these like injuries. You <laughs> Who know, doesn't like, stick his to bed, sheets? his bed was just covered in all these blood marks. And I was like, you know, uh, just, you know, for a frame of reference, like you're going into a profession that really requires you to use your body you know like i'm a lawyer it's I the can, gentle way Jen. i don't need my body you don't need your you need your brain but not your body to be a lawyer but um you know i think kelly was like okay i don't think this is going to work out for me playing judo wrong, and actually trying wrong. yeah so so he had his little he had his moment. but uh, you know i do think um you know we have another friend who recently he was teaching some sambo at a you know a local martial arts studio and uh shout out lavin and um, he's like, come over. And he threw me, I got thrown to the ground 50 times that night. And literally I was crippled. I was in my forties. The next day I was like, dude, I just like, I don't, I don't know if I can do this a lot. And I realized just how many times I'd been, like you say, had been thrown to the ground in high school playing football or in the tackle we played in the grass with friends and just the exposure of, wow, that's really uncomfortable. I'm really stiff. It's okay. And I even think about one of the first conversations I had in in actual American football with our coach said, okay, you're going to be hurting between now and the end of the season. Everything will hurt every single day. Let's make an agreement that we're all hurting. That's okay. And part of this game. And if you think you're injured, let's have a conversation. But he really had this, he set everyone's expectations of like, oh yeah, you're going to be tackled by flying around people wearing plastic helmets for the next 10 weeks. You should probably get used to it. And I think if we just said that to people, by the way, life is pain, Highness. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's what the, you know, the Princess Bride was trying to do. Yeah. yeah. No, that expectation is huge, right? Like setting that expectation. Um, I agree. I think, you know, when you end up, when you start talking to people, a lot of people have some pain thing that's bothering them. We're just not all talking about it. And right. if you actually, you know, took some data on that and kind of share it with people, it'd probably help set up their expectations a little bit. I was thinking about, you know, this pain sensitivity thing too. We have research, right? Looking at kids who have been in the NICU, you know, what kids who are exposed to needle pricks from a young age end up demonstrating more hypersensitivity as they age as compared to kids who weren't exposed to those things. So I think it, it can go that way and it can go the other way of exposing people at a young age to gradually increasing levels of stress to help desensitize their system. I just think it's one of those things we just, it seems like, again, kind of like the, what we were talking about earlier, it only comes up when the person has pain or an injury, but we should be thinking about exposing our system to stress in appropriate doses before we have pain and injury to make it more resilient. And I, you know, so it's, but getting people motivated to think about that, it's kind of cool that the health information seems to be kind of blowing up right now. And I, you know, you know, people getting into sauna and ice baths and things like that, you know, and people are doing it for a lot of different reasons. But the cool thing to me is that it also is exposing them to these stresses and probably making them more resilient for things in this kind of injury pain PT realm. I think we're going to see haves and have nots people who are in communities that start to value this or walking more walking dogs versus don't where I think we're really going to see a dichotomy as you know, maybe Ozempic will come in and save us all, right? But uh, chances are we really are at least beginning to see that the functional unit of change is in the household. And that's just to circle back around, you know, Juliet and I really feel like we do work at these large scale institutions, so at university levels. We've, you know, we work at corporations, we work with branches of the government. 
it's very difficult to make systematic changes at the top and to to fundamentally alter. And I think this is something that we come, we talked in the beginning just about the, how PT attached itself to this insurance model, this medical model, so it could become legitimate. It created a beast and now it's hard to back out of that. Yeah. It's hard to change these bureaucracies and these systems at that level. And I challenge anyone, come on in, go ahead. You can reach out to Justin Moore. You can reach out to the head of the APTA and be mm -hmm. like, okay, I have, I have the ultimate plan, but no one has, but simultaneously, what you have done is gone right into people's homes and said, hey, here's where we can really start to make this fundamental change with you and a family member, you and a household member, you can get some relief and start to manage this without having to activate that EMS system, which mm -hmm. I just think I just can't give you kudos enough for. The household is the functioning unit of change. Well, thank you. I mean, that's the ultimate goal with it, right? It's just to empower people because at the end of the day, I think you can make this stuff really complicated and complex, but at the end of the day, if you just have some education and you start moving and you do it in kind of graded doses, your system improves. Like the system is amazingly adaptable and resilient. And, you know, I just think if you get online, you can start to get yourself spun up because it can seem so complicated. Like I've got knee pain and uh, all these people are saying all these different things. I don't know what I should do. Really, you can you can break it down and it can be pretty simple. It doesn't have to be that complicated if you can get it moving with some you know, find some ways to kind of reduce sensitivity, work on slowly improving mobility, and then make it more resilient with resistance training. I think it doesn't have to be that complicated. And it's something you can grab a book and start doing. And, you know, like I said before, it's not to tell people never go to PT, but definitely start on your own, because most of the things get better with these simple things. And if it doesn't get better, then go see someone by all means, or if you've had a surgery, you know, I, I we didn't cover any post surgical stuff. I think there's a lot of there's a case to be made for a lot of those things. If you've had an ACL reconstruction, it's probably good to have someone work with your surgeon and create a program that, you know, fits with your impairments and your healing process. But there's so much you can do just with learning some movements for that area of your body. So my question to you is, since we're nearing the end, is what are you looking forward to? What are you excited about? And I want to ask that question with an appreciation that you just released a book you're going around the world talking about the book. You probably want to um, go into a dark room in the fetal position nope. and rest. Don't get to um, do that. If my own experience is, is any uh, is any example, but um, what are you looking forward to? What's next? You know, who are you talking to about this book? Like, what what's what's looking forward for you, Tom? Yeah, no, I'm honestly loving this part. The uh, getting towards the end of the writing part and the editing that was not so fun, but. I think being an educator at my roots, I love doing the podcast. I could nerd out on this stuff and talk about it for hours. I just, this part is so fun to me and I'm looking forward. We're going to basically, um, after this book, uh, take each of the body region chapters and make them their own book. So Great. you guys have probably seen the, you know, there's like the treat your back, treat your shoulder. So it'll be like that, but we'll just, there'll be more comprehensive books. I think updated beyond where those things were, but you know, kind of like a rehab your neck, rehab your back. So I'm excited to create those because there's still people who look at this book and they're like, it's too expensive. It's too big. It's intimidating to them to have a textbook size book. To me, it seems like it's like 46 bucks. It doesn't seem that bad when I think about what I paid for textbooks when I was going to college. So, you know, um, to have a resource that you can just access for your whole body, but I get it. Some people want just, I just want something for my low back. So I think That'll be the thing. And then eventually down the road, I'd like to, you know, um, create courses where there's video content and maybe have a rehab science certification or something like that, that teaches therapeutic exercise to individuals of all rehab and fitness backgrounds. Because for six years, I taught for a group called Red Cord. I don't know if you guys ever knew Red Cord. They, it was a, it's a suspension system from Norway, but it's sort oh, yeah. of like, but you can test people. You test different positions. It's all closed chain. And then you prescribe exercise based on that. And the PTs always thought it was cool, but because they had already had a good foundation in assessment and exercise prescription, they, it wasn't as novel to them as it was to the fitness professionals. Like whenever I'd go teach Pilates groups or yoga instructors, they wanted to stay for hours afterwards because they always had all these exercise variations to use with people, but they didn't really know when to prescribe them. And so I think there's a big opportunity out there to help some of the fitness professionals better manage people who have pain and injuries because 
I mean, if we're being honest, they're the point of contact. They're the point of contact. There's so many yeah. people seeing their fitness professional first with pain or injury. And, you know, when I was, I remember early on the PT I worked for in the beginning, it was all about protect your intellectual property and don't share it with anyone. And that was the mindset that I was kind of raised in initially in a clinic. And I just have realized, luckily I had a bunch of friends in the strength and conditioning world. So I had both sides kind of influencing me, but I think at the end of the day, the goal is to help people. And I think having courses that help get fitness professionals up to a level where they feel more confident, kind of helping people who have pain and injuries is the next step. And I know there's groups out there doing this, but I think I feel fortunate to have this platform to have rehab science where it's at and to be able to just kind of, that's something I'm excited about is that next step of creating more of this educational material for the practitioners. Cause the book was kind of for both, but really for like the regular person who just wanted a resource to self-manage things. The, Are you kidding? Uh, this, this book, every physio student on the planet, hear me now. This is your cheat code. Just yep. memorize this. You'll be able to w handle first day anyone who ever comes into you. Yep, for sure. I mean, you think about it. It's a therapy. I, I, there was not a good therapeutic exercise book when I was in PT school. It was yeah. like, oh, you learn these in your affiliations. I mean, to yeah. have had something like this where I could have been like, oh, I've got this person with tennis elbow. Here's what another PT would prescribe, and it's broken into phases. It's a, it's a book I would have wanted when I came out of school. So. Yeah, that's been really cool actually to see doctors and chiropractic, you know, newer chiropractors and newer PTs get excited about it. That's been pretty, that's been pretty awesome. So anyways, that's, I'm just loving it right now. I'm just going around and talking about it. And this is like it, such, I, I'm not in a clinic. I'm not in a clinic all day. This is unbelievable. It, does that feel like you are the primary PT in the family now? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even though still, your wife is, uh, this is actually just about getting out of your wife's shadow. I understand. It's oh, okay, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Long way around the barn, Tom. Yeah. I tried. Yeah, all right. So, yeah. yeah we, uh, tell our listeners where they can find you. Um, obviously, you know, I, I can tell them they can buy your book on Amazon or anywhere that they get books. But um, what about learning more about what you're doing on the socials and websites and so forth? Yeah, I'm pretty much at Rehab Science Everywhere, mostly Instagram. And I've been putting more time in the last couple of years to YouTube. So that has, um, it's similar to kind of the concept of Instagram, but obviously just more detail, me talking through exercises. So it's a little bit more detailed in that way. But yeah, pretty much on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. But uh, yeah, that's where people can find me, rehabscience.com. And then the book is obviously just Rehab Science as well. So The Ready State has followed at Rehab Science for six years. Kelly, I remember I, you mentioned, I had someone message me and they were like listening to your podcast and, oh, Kelly said I should check out your... I, I really appreciate that. It was years ago and you mentioned that and I, and I have not forgotten it. It stuck with me. I really appreciate it. It's easy to spot superstars. <laughs> Thanks, brother. My Thanks friend. again, Tom. Thanks Thank for you being so with much, us. Tom. Thanks, you guys. Thank you for listening to the Ready State Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, check out all our episodes here or at thereadystate.com. And be sure to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes to help others find our show. Check us out and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ready State. Until next time, cheers, everyone. You got it.